is working. I have to indirectly find out whether it is working. Okay, so we will start. Last class we <coughs> saw chapter 10, almost, uh, I think, three fourth of chapter 10 is done. Little bit we have in chapter 10, which we will finish this week and then move on to chapter 11. So, we are here, Krishna is describing uh, the glories, the glories of divine manifestation, about 70 different examples he has taken. Instead of going by the shlokas, I am trying to do it uh, on some categories. So it's all pulled from all over the shlokas, but anyway. So we have a little bit more to do here, one or two categories, and then we will end the chapter with a couple of shlokas and then move on. So we saw this last class, I think perhaps towards the end I was talking about it. There is a set of examples he is pointing to, which are all, all over in our creation. It has uh, plants, it has animal kingdom, you know anything, everything is available here. Uchai Shravas, which is, came out of the when they did the Samudra Matana, 14 items came out of it. One of them was a horse, flying horse, which is Uchai Shravas. Then Maam Amrita Udbhavam. I came from that Amrita Matana when they were churning the, you know, ocean of milk. Denu Namasmi Kamaduk, that also came from there. Airavatam Gajendra Nam, that also came from there. The first three items are from the churning of the milk, a milky ocean. Sarpana Masmi Vasukihi, Anantascha Asmi Naganam. So Sarpa and Naga, I was trying to explain why they are slightly two different things as different people think it to be. Mriganam Cha Mrigendroham, amongst all animals, I am the king of the animals, which is the lion. Vainateyas Cha Pakshinam, I am this majestic hawk or Garuda or you know all those, that family. That is the king of the bird kingdom. So that's what Vainateyah has. Vainateyascha Pakshinam, Jashanam Makarascha, I am the shark in the, you know, fish category, right? Merhu, huh? no, shark. Makara, in, in this context it is. Merhu Shikarinamaham, of all the peaked mountains, I am the Meru, right? Stavaranam Himalaya, of the non-moving, stira, stavara is one which cannot move, which are typically mountains. So stavaranam himalaya, ashwataha sarva vrikshanam, of all the trees I am the pipal tree, arali marantha health in Kannada. Sarasamasmi sagaraha, of all water bodies, which is not a stream, water body. If you take a water body, he says I am the ocean. And srotasam, which is a moving stream. Running water. Srotasamasmi Janavi, which is the Ganges. Masanam Margasi Shoham. Rithunam Kusumakaraha. Of all these seasons, I am the season which is a flowering season. Vasantakala. Kusumakaraha. That which can, you know, flower. I think I stopped here last class. I, uh, so, uh, the next set of things which could, this is a very deep philosophical idea. Because. Uh, what is common to all these four is time. Time is a deep philosophical idea. Don't think time is a very casual idea. It's a very deep idea. We need to reflect on it. It's why he says, Kalam, Kalaha Kalayatamaham. Of all measurement systems, I am the time. The time is the masterpiece of measurement. Time is the only measurement which is, flows only in the forward direction. Is unilaterally moving forward. And Time is the master check on many things in whatever happens in this world. You have to reflect on this idea. So he says, of all measurement systems, I am the time. See me there. Right? Aham eva akshaya kalaha. Aham akshaya kalaha. Aham eva. I am the only undestroyable element of time, which means all others are destroyable. That is the fact. 
all worldly things will perish in time. Time, you know, I will show you that shloka from, you know, Siva uh, Parada. It's a nice shloka there. I just wanted to show that. People have vividly thought about this idea. This is not a scary idea, but it is an idea which we need to deeply reflect on. Okay, it will put us in a certain perspective. It will make us think more, you know, elaborately, more objectively about many things that we do in life. That's why this time is very important. Mrityuhu sarva haras chaham. Of all that entities which have this characteristic of destroying, I am the destroyer. I am that property of destroying everything. So it's all related to time anyway. Sarganam adihi antascha madhyamcha. These whole, you know, you know, birth and death and all these rotation that is sarga is this chakar. In that I am the beginning, I am the middle, I am the end. I am there everywhere. So all these together talks about this grand concept called time. If we can reflect on time, we will make meaning to our life. We must reflect on time. We will make a lot of meaning to the way we organize life, the way we go about life. I think it is not an issue which we need to shy away. It is not an issue which we need to worry. We need to very objectively understand because it's a reality. Time is the greatest reality on which we should think. So people have naturally talked about it in several. I have many, I just took two of them. <coughs> there is this nice shloka which says, Ayur nashyati pashyatam pratidinam yatikshayam yavvanam pratyayanti gataha punarna divasaha kalo jagat bhakshakaha Lakshmi stoya taranga bhanga chapala vidyuchalam jivitam tasmadmam sharanagatam sharanada tomraksha rakshaduna Very nice con issue which Shankaracharya brings through this shloka. He says, Ayur nashyati pashyatam. I keep saying this very often. Moment we are born, nobody is growing. Don't have this imagination we are growing. The day we are born, we are shrinking. I am making a very objective statement. Are you living for 120 years? Please live for 120 years. Multiply it with 365.25. Let X be the number of days. After one day, your balance has come down. After two days, your balance has come down. So we are not growing. Never have this uh, you know, hallucination. Moment you have Janma, we are heading towards Mrityu. In between there is a Jara and Vyadi. It's very simple. That's one dimension. This is not a dimension to scare us. It is a dimension to put realism into our minds. That's what he says. Ayur nashyati pashyatam prati dinam. See, there is one Ayur, you know, Ayur, Ayur Ruch. Ayur Ruch. The first mantra in Ayur Ruch, which is in Rigveda, it says, as sun rises every day, so our ancestors have been very objective in understanding reality. First Ruch, Ruch says, as sun rises every day, it's like one feather is cut from this bird. That's how they start. Of course, they are saying, Dirga Yuhu, you know, that is how the uh, Ruk ends with every shloka. That's okay. But the point is, nobody grows. Never have an iota of imagination, you are growing, you are only shrinking. From the time you are born, you are shrinking. Grow in, in physical sense. In time sense, everybody is shrinking. In time sense, nobody can grow. We can only shrink. That's what he is saying. That's why Ahameva Akshayaha Kalaha. That's what he is saying. Ayurna Shyati Pashyatam Pratidinam. How do you know it? Yatikshayam Yavanam. This youthfulness is gone. We are seeing for ourselves. These are verifiable things. He is not telling some that x equal to something at all, he is not saying, he is saying which you and I know. Yati kshayam yavanam, the yavanam is becoming kshaya. Yati, it is being spent, it moves on. It moves on and it becomes, you know, the youth, youth is uh, going out of us. That's a great understanding of this concept. Then he says, pratyayanti gataha, he says time is unilateral. Right? Punarna divasaha, gataha divasaha, punaha na pratyay, punar, punaha na pratyayanti. Days which have gone by will never come back. This is only parameter or variable which science cannot reverse. You have lost one hour, today is last. It's perishable. Life is perishable. Everything we seem to value in life is perishable. The laptop, the gadget, the relationship, the property, movable, immovable, position, everything is perishable. 
we are actually going after perishables not permanent so pratyayanti gataha punar na divasaha why kalo jagat bakshaka this time the notion called time is the greatest eater it consumes everything that comes in its way that's what he says kalo jagat bakshaka then he says lakshmi stoya taranga banga chapala toya is water taranga is wave so the waves coming out of the water it needs a few seconds for it to break it's a ripple na it's a bigger ripple Ray. what is uh, you know wave it is a uh, ripple with a if it if it is a stationary water system you put a stone into it it's called ripple in a bigger system the same ripple is called wave that's why he says toya taranga banga the breaking of the wave is a matter of you go to the beach and stand there you can become philosophical also you can keep looking at this idea it breaks a few seconds here and there and this lakshmi is as chapala as this he say this wealth that we are gathering just like that it's it's very very fickle it's not very permanent it is the highest perishability of the highest order that's what he is saying he is saying how is this lakshmi chapala the lakshmi is chapala as much as this toya taranga banga just like the wave which started developing just went off that's all is the level of permanence you you have you have to understand that has for material wealth then he says vidyut chalam jeevitam when the life goes for anyone doesn't matter which age and so on it goes like a lightning just like a flash of a lightning is how the life goes because if it takes more than that science will find a way of catching it so that's not going to happen if there is a way we, it is going to take more time science will catch it we'll find a way of uh, have a capacitor and store it or something like electricity that's why it will never happen it says vidyut chalam jeevitam just like a lightning which appears for a flash and then disappears when life goes it goes like that that's what he is saying he says this in, in three lines he says things around us are perishable please understand there is nothing permanent things around us are objectively speaking perishable now all these shlokas will find in plenty never come to an imagination or a conclusion therefore do udasina of that that was not the spirit because people take a wrong understanding of it in the shloka is meant not to say oh all these are anyway perishable no let me take my hands off not that the reason for these ideas are don't stick to it like a fool too much you are not asked to go to the other extreme you are asked to come out of this extreme to somewhere in the middle this idea is not to say go to the other extreme the idea is say you are in the other in this extreme which is a, not a great idea come out of it don't have so much of sense of agency and endowment because that's foolish you are betting on a big risk for yourself that is the meaning of it i think we must work we must earn our perishables but put a value to it put a value to it what it deserves mentally these shlokas are meant for it put a value to the perishables go after the perishables but then know your limits not to say you know throw everything away. i am not saying that i'm saying try to understand how to position it that's why he says tasmat maam sharanagatam sharanada tom raksha raksha adana so you take now tom raksha raksha aduna right now does not mean protect from me here it means please sit in my brain in my mind and give me a perspective which i will be able to handle that is called uh, i will talk about it today chapter 11 is uh, in my opinion the toughest chapter for a reason i will at that time i'll come to this point again we need anugraha i will come to that uh, idea later chapter 11 will be actually very misleading if you read we'll come to it as soon as we are done with this look at this vairagya shataka is a nice shloka there it says yoga na bukta bhoga na bukta vayameva bukta ha we go after bhoga yayati story we know in mahabharat after so much of time he exchanged his youth which is fifth son after 1000 years he said i wasted my time it's like pouring oil into a fire that's what he said it said what has happened after 1000 years my karma came down no it actually went up it's utter nonsense that he realized much later so going after this bhokta we will be eaten away why am i a bhokta we will be consumed in the process our desire will never 
speak, there is no end to it. That's what he says, Bhogana Bhukta. We have not consumed desire, desire has consumed us. Vayameva Bhukta. Tapona Tapta. Vayameva Tapta. This Tapa is Tapas. That Tapta is being scorched with heat. Tapatrayanta health. Heat. So, you, you thought you are doing Tapas, in the process you get burnt. Because you are not mentally in the right frame. If you are not mentally in the right frame, Tapona Tapta. Vayameva Tapta. He will be burnt in this whole process. Kalona Yataha, just now we said that. Vayameva Yataha, time did not pass by, we pass by. Although in common parlance, we use this word, time pass by, time will never pass by, you pass by the time. That is the meaning. Vayameva Yataha, Kalona Yata. Time is a unilateral variable, flowing and flowing and flowing. Time will never pass, we will pass. So Vayameva Yataha, Trishnana Jirna. This unquenchable desire called Trishna, that never becomes Jirna. We become Jirna. You get worn out. That unquenchable desire never gets worn out. So the perishables are posing such a big challenge to us if we don't have the right sense of discrimination about life. That is what he is coming to. He is coming to saying, put appropriate value for the perishables and leave it there. Don't, uh, you know, overdo that, is what he is actually coming to in this particular example. Then, there are set of very interesting attributes which are again spread over the shlokas. So far he pointed to things which are apparently physical. Rishis, Devatas, then plant kingdom, animals, Avatara Purushas. Here, they are concepts. This is the charm of divinity. You should be able to see divinity when you see something good. He is now going to that level. He is going beyond the material plane. See the set of attributes he has put here. He says, Bhutanam Asmi Chetana. The Chit Shakti that you see in Bhuta is actually me. You know, our ability to talk, our ability to work, our ability to do Vyavahara are all coming from where? That God particle, moment it goes out of the body, the prana goes. This is uh, uh, good only for consigning it to flames or putting it in a box and putting it under the earth. Beyond that, this has no value. As long as this prana is going in and out, uh, the chit shakti will be there. That, you know, intelligence. The intelligence is contained where? It is contained in the prana. It is non, not contained. Modern science says it is in this chromosome, that DNA, all DNA will go to hell after you take the prana. It's nowhere there. It is there. That is a God particle he is saying. First you understand you are doing Vyavahara only because I am with you. Is what he is saying. Please see divinity there. Right? Jnanam Jnanavatamaham Sattvam Sattvatamaham Tejas Tejas Vinamaham Look at these three. When you see good things, some people, you know, Swami Vivekananda goes to parliament of religions. Right? 1890, he goes to parliament of religions and then he says, my, my dear brothers and sisters of America and then the whole country, is the whole parliament assembly is fell flat and so on. So why don't we try and go and say, dear brothers and sisters, nothing will happen. Because it is not Swami Vivekananda. That's what he says. He says, Tejas Tejas Vinam. That, what is that which is attracting? That is the manifestation of divinity through a Vyakti called Swami Vivekananda on that day, in that platform, when he rose. Right? Some people are extraordinarily brilliant. It is just a manifestation of divinity. You can't take ahankar to that. Good things that you see around you. So the whole slide is all about saying good things that see around you are actually divinity. Divinity is not uh, you know smoky white something you know disappears something comes through a medium. Those are all there for lack of some communication. They are dramatizing with all 3D effects. That is not divinity. Divinity is here. When you see every one of this, you should see divinity. Jnanam jnanavatamaham. The greatest people when you see, it is a flow of divinity. The manifestation of divinity is much more. Much more evident. 
Sattvam Sattvatamaha. For all those people who are Sattvic, that Sattvic property is what I am. I am actually expressing through them. Tejas Tejas Vinamaham. Dando Damayitamasvi. When, when people get punished, that action of punishment is me again. In other words, every action that you see in this world, you should be able to see me. He has again taken a very small list. We have to extend this logic. He is saying, don't look elsewhere for divinity. Divinity is nowhere. Divinity is just around you. If you fail to see it, you will never see it. You read any amount of Veda, you read any amount of Stotra, you go to any number of sages and sannyasis and gurus, nothing will happen. Because it is, no, it is not outside. It is around. It is in the eye of the beholder. So, dando damayitam asmi, nitihi asmi jigishitam. When some things are won over, there is that order which is winning over it. You see me there. That is the expression of divinity you must be able to see. Prajanas chasmi kandarpaha. This uh, desire to bring offsprings, you will see me there. Even there you will see only me. Right? Udbhavascha bhavishyatam. Those who are all well endearing, bringing them up. How does it happen? Again you know, it happens only because of me. So in this maunam cha, cha eva asmi guhyanam. When people who don't speak, silence is me. Divinity expresses through silence. Actually you must experience it. If you go to great people, you will experience it. The more, the less they talk, you see more vibration. You see something more happening. That's why in Dakshinamurti Stotra he says, Mauna Vyakya Prakatita Parabrahma Tattvam Yuvanam Vatsishtante Vasashikanai Ravrutam Brahmanishtai Hi Acharya Entram Karakalita Chinmudra Mananda Murtim Swatma Ramam Mudita Vadanam Dakshinamurti Mira He says, Mauna Vyakya Prakatita Parabrahma Tattvam How did he explain the ultimate truth? By silence. Just by silence. Now, you know, Muni, Muni is called Muni because he is Manana Shilaha. Mauna and Manana, deep contemplation. If you can be in the Sannidhi or in the company of a person who is absolute silence, your ability to become more reflective and learn is much more. This looks paradoxical. That is the truth. People who talk less can communicate more to you. This is a lesson of communication also. People who talk less can actually communicate more. People who don't talk anything can communicate a lot more. This is very paradoxical. The divinity is expressing much more in that's what he is saying. Vadaha Pravadatamaham. Those who win arguments, where is this skill of winning the argument? I express through their tongue. See divinity there. When good things happen, see you learn to see divinity there. Otherwise, divinity can never be seen. So he says, Vadaha Pravadatamaham. Indriyana Manas Chasmi. Of all the Indriyas, Manas is called a super Indriya. In chapter 13, there is one shloka. It says, Indriyanam Dashaikam. 10 plus 1. That's what he says. Because this plus 1 is a super Indriya. Manas is a super Indriya. It doesn't require any of these Karma Indriyas and Jnana Indriyas. It can do all the work. Without eye, it can see. Without, without mouth, it can have a sumptuous lunch. That's what we do in dream. In dream, we, we do Karma Indriya and Jnana Indriya without using any of these. That power is with Manas. So of all the Indriyas, the super Indriya is me. He says, see the best in class and see me there. He says, Indriyana manaha chasmiyaham. Then he puts several things that you see. A yeah, very cultured la lady will have all these. All of them are expressions of me, he says. He says, Kirti, Shrihi, Vak, Narinam, of the ladies. Smriti, Medha, Dhritihi, Kshama, Jayaha, all these. No, sorry, this is different. Up to this. What is interesting about this is all of them are in Sri Linga. All these padas are also in Sri Linga. In Sanskrit, you know, Kirtihi is a Sri Linga. Right? Shri is a Sri Linga. Vak is a Sri Linga, actually. Speech is actually not a Napumsuka Linga or Pulliga. It is actually Sri Linga. He says, these best attributes that you see in a lady, which is in terms of the fame and the, you know, Kirti or the thing that she is able to bring forward, the material richness and this fullness that she brings, the speech with which she actually makes a difference, right? Smriti, the memory, Medha, the Medha Shakti, 
and dhriti. So there are, there are dhriti is steadfastness, perseverance, kshama, all those are part of dhriti. So he, he has hit two, you know, mangoes with one stone. First of all, he said, what are the attributes of those best ladies? And then he also says, I am there, that is the expression of divinity. Both he has said in this, all of them are in Sri Linga. These padas are all in Sri Linga. Jayosmi, Vyavasayosmi, those who really put a lot of effort, when they win out of their efforts, it's because of divinity. That's why Anugraha is important. I put a lot of effort, I lose. Which means divinity is not there. Effort is not uh, is only a necessary condition, not a sufficient condition. Effort is a necessary condition, not a sufficient condition. That's why he says, Jayosmi, Vyavasayosmi. Those who make a lot of effort, you see me there. When they win, you see me there. I am there. That's what he says. Dataham Vishwato Mukaha. I am, you can see me, the supporter of this whole world. Nobody can support this world. I mean, you can do any amount of thing. Rain cannot be, you know, artificial rain can be a few droplets here and there. Rain is a divine activity. Nobody can, on earth can fix it. This sustainability of this great planet is a divine activity. Science can here and there help us a little bit temporarily address issues for the time being. It cannot solve the problem. That's why he says, Vishwato Mukaha, I am spread everywhere you see I am there and I am actually supporting all of them. I am the ultimate supporter, I am the root cause of sustainability, whatever sustainability you want to talk, environmental sustainability, economic sustainability, social sustainability, whatever you want to say, see me there. That's what he said when he talked about para prakriti in chapter 7, apara prakriti and para prakriti, this is the definition he gave for para prakriti. He said, Jiva Bhutam Mahabaho Yeyedam Dharyate Jagat. That concept of mind which supports this whole, you know, Jiva Rashi is in this world. That is called Para Prakriti. He says, I have come like that. That's what he said in chapter 7. He started this triplet with that. There he said, Jiva Bhutam Mahabaho Yeyedam Dharyate Jagat. By that with which this whole Jiva Bhutas are supported. Learn that to be aparastu anya para. That's where this definition comes. It's a para prakriti, which he talked about in chapter 7. So in this, Krishna is saying that when you see good things, the first thing that strikes in your mind is, I am now seeing an expression of divinity. If we miss that, we will miss divinity. That is the message he is actually getting here. When good things happen, when great things happen, it is all divinity. That is much stronger expression of divinity. So, so many he said. Then he ended the chapter with a few four shlokas. We will go over those four shlokas. Then he said, Yachapi Sarva Bhutanam Bijam Tat Aham Arjuna. Whatever is the Jiva Bhuta. He said only living beings. He never said Naras. Anything that lives. Anything that is classified as a jiva, which means which, which lives, the seed is me, the prana is me, the living attribute called prana is me, is what he is saying, that bija, that root cause of that, that is the wonder. One seed falls from a, or a crow or some bird, you know, eats the fruit, drops the seed somewhere, one seed, one seed falls. And that seed becomes a massive tree and lives for 800 years, 2000 years. Go and see in, you know, Buddha Gaya. The tree is 2000 years. You don't know which is the main trunk, which is the side trunk. You go to Anuradhapura in Sri Lanka. You don't know because, you know, when uh, uh, Ashoka, you know, gave his uh, daughter in marriage to the king of uh, Sri Lanka, one sapling was given, they have preserved it even now. 2400 years. Oh, they have put nice silver. With so much reverence, they have actually, you know, protected this. I went and saw, I don't know which was the main trunk. And the charm is, from one seed, you can get thousand such mighty trees. And the thousand mighty trees will multiply it by thousand into thousand into thousand. It doesn't mean the second tree is less in Virya. The third generation tree is even less in Virya. Vitality. The fourth generation is even less in... No. The vitality is never... Compromise. Why? Because I am there. 
it's the divinity which is expressing so it is purnamudam purnamudam purnat purnamudachyate purnasya purnamadaya purnameva avashishyate take fullness out of fullness what remains is fullness infinity minus infinity is equal to infinity that's what that shloka is that is what it is that's why that bija is god particle which is anadi ananta aparichinna limitless cannot be contained that's why you take one tree out of which millions of trees will come the millionth tree will not be lacking in vitality compared to the first tree which came in this universe no way only way, only way we can change the vitality is do some genetic injection on it we can change the vitality a little bit one way or the other otherwise no then he says na tat asti vina yat syat maya bhutam characharam he makes a finally one concluding statement he says characharam bhutam take moving or unmoving attributes you see in this universe because these examples were all like that take that which is moving and unmoving a rock may not be moving a mountain may not be moving a water body may be moving an animal may be moving a plant will not be moving you and i may be moving so chara and achara moving and unmoving bhuta if you take what he says is maya vina without me vina is without hindi mein bina bolta hai vina bina ek hi hai so vina is without maya vina yat syat if there is something which is there without me right na tad asti such a thing does not exist so he says maya vina yat syat in case something can be there without me tat na asti such a thing doesn't exist where it doesn't exist chara charam bhutam so nothing exists without me so matta parataram na anyat kinjis asti dananjaya is close the same argument is closed here same thing is saying without me nothing is there if you fail to see it you need some more time you need to see it i have given you a few examples here and there but if you cannot see it you have to wait maybe you didn't get that wisdom so that's what he is saying you know i was reading somewhere you can have any amount of zeros you need a one for a value seen there was one chief minister called mg ramachandran in tamil nadu so in tamil nadu even today same thing happening tamil nadu all ministers are saying we are all zeros now jayalalitha is the one and they have no difficulty in saying it they say we are all zeros only when jayalalitha comes it becomes one so she should be ahead if, if, if zeros are ahead of us it has no value so it all should be behind her in mgr cabinet also they said the same thing so that is you know jokingly that's what he saying i am the one for all the zeros without this one the zero has no value that's what adi shankara in his uh, bashya also he says tad atmana vinirmukta that which is liberated from this concept called atman if there is one padartha in which you take out the atman vinirmukta moksha i mean it's there is no atman in in that padartha assuming he says jagat asat sampadyate such a thing will be asat it is not sat there is nothing there non existence is the definition for it is what he is saying that's what he is saying here he is saying so divinity is everywhere divinity is not a exclusive domain for someone with a certain it is in the eye of the beholder it is a training we have in us a certain mental makeup our understanding of this beautiful reality that has been created this universe is nothing but expression of divinity is nothing but divinity if we can train our mind we will see if we can't train our mind we will never see and there's no room for argument here we'll have to just leave it at that saying that's you know how it is nanto asti mama divyanam vibhutinam parantapa yesha tu uddeshah prokto vibhuti hi vistaro maya he says this my vibhuti is endless obviously it is endless he says antah na asti nanto asti you have to do it like this antah na asti there is no end for what mama vibhuti nam my this manifest power of manifestation uh, what is that it is divya it is divine it is pure this pure manifestation of mind he parantapa 
is an adjective for Arjuna. It's a sambodhana. Hey Parantapa, there is no end to my manifestation. How, how much can I say? There is no end. I have to keep on saying. That is why Yeshaha, all these, Yeshaha points to these 70 examples which we saw. Yeshaha, right, to Uddeshataha, roughly I took. Because you know it is too long, the list is too long. Therefore, uh, I just took a small sample. Uddeshataha vibhutihi vistaromaya. I take a I took a few, just approximately, I mean, randomly perhaps. And then uh, with a little bit I told you. So that's how this vibhuti yoga more or less comes to an end. Where he shows the concept of the one in the many. This one concept is there, so he concludes with two more shlokas actually, but the discussion of vibhuti is here, one more idea he says, with that the chapter ends. Yad yad vibhuti mat sattvam shimat urjitam evava tattad eva avagachatvam mama tejom shasambam. Anything that you see, great. So he now says, why are you bothering? I will tell you a simple rule. Tejas tejas vinam aham, jnanam jnanavatam asmi, right, sattvam sattvam aham, all those are examples. He says, why are you bothering so much? Anything that you see which is great, the wow factor that you have is actually an expression of divinity. Simply he says like that finally, right? See, Srimat Urjitam, that which is, you know, great and one of this uh, high level thing, eva va, right? Tat, tat, eva, all that, avagacha, understand that. Whenever you see something which is, off, you know, abstract, when you are abstract, it's a stellar performance by somebody. It's the power of nature that you see. It can be anything. It is the beauty of the creation that you see. Anything in which you are abstract, he gives a very simple idea to recognize divinity. Anything on which you are abstract, you see me there. See, you know, your Ishta Devata there. If you don't know, see, see divinity as a Nirguna, don't worry. If Rama is favorite God, see Rama there. If Krishna is your favorite God, see Krishna there. If Kali is your favorite God, please see Kali there. That's what he is saying finally. He says, anything which you are off-struck, I am there. See me there. That's the easiest way to understand my vibhuti. Then, he says one more thing. He says, Atava, Bahuna, Bahuna yetena, Kim yatena tavarjana. Why are you worried about this? So many varieties. This is too complicated. I am now telling you, you know, plant kingdom, animal kingdom, this, that. Bahuni etena. Bahuna etena. So, Atava, otherwise, why should you know all this? Understand everything in this world is a part of mind. That's what he finally says. He says, Vishtabhyaham idam krishnam. All that that has manifested in, that you have been able to see. Anything that you see has manifested. Vishtabhyam. Idam sa, krishnam sarvam ekam shena stito jagat. This whole creation of universe that you see, right, in many ways, what are they? They are all one part of me actually. Ekam shena stito jagat. I have actually manifested, a part of mine is actually spreading out like this. This is what he finally concluded. Essentially in this chapter, he again and again is saying, Divinity, there are two, three very important things we have to understand. Divinity is nothing but that which is off-struck. When you are off-struck, that is actually divinity. Divinity is not something which is beyond our reach or imagination. Divinity is not something which is, uh, you know, an, a very complicated idea to, you know, find out what it is. He is saying divinity is everywhere. You have to only change your perspective you it is uh, the in the eye of the beholder the div notion of divinity exists that is what he is getting finally that if you can understand this you will be able to see divinity and remember i started by saying because he said everything that you see here is me evil is also divinity bad things are also divinity that's one type of manifestation the power of manifestation is not perfect it is a slider from minus infinity to plus infinity. So, you know, evil and good are all part of infinity. 
it's only a scale on which they are measured differently and you know as i was saying why he chose only good things because he wants us to evolve he wants us to take a reference and be like that that is why he has chosen all these specific examples and that's how he actually so he ended by the chapter by saying ekam shena stito jagat everything is a part of mine that is the seed for the next chapter because in one now he is saying i am the one in everything and here he showed that one in the many in the next chapter he is going to show the many in one so that is how we have to understand anything please understand first gold as gold necklace gold ring gold bracelet gold whatever whatever gold stud please understand first thoroughly understand gold like that once you have thoroughly understand gold like that if you are deeply engrossed in that concept very well then you are now ready to understand gold in a different way you know how i will give you a piece of gold you will see this thousand items in that when i show you gold you will see a necklace there you will see a ring there you will see a bracelet there everything you will see there because you are now aware that these are all come from gold because these are all come from gold when i show gold you will be able to see all of them you don't have to stick a necklace there moment i show you gold you will see a necklace there you will see a stud there you will see a ring there you will see a bracelet there everything you will see that is the trick he is doing now he is saying see me here 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 and here do shavana manana nidhi dhyasa of this idea understand divinity is all over if you have mastered this art then in one you will be able to see all of them that is what the next chapter is going to be i just want to also say one more in conclusion about chapter 10 the ideas that we have seen in this chapter has been adequately expressed in two occasions in the previous chapters i just want to point it to you in chapter 7 right there are four shlokas from shloka 8 to 12 i made off and on reference to that there are four shlokas 8 to 12 in which 18 of these manifestations have been already explained these are them rasoham apsukaunteya prabhasmi sasi suryayoh pranav sarva vedeshu shabda hake paurusham nrishu punyo gandham prithivyam cha all these are in a different way as already said tejas tejas chasmi vibhavaso jeevitam sarva bhuteshu that's what he said what we saw now tapas chasmi tapas vishu just now we saw satvam satvavatam aham bijam mam sarva bhutana same idea right buddhihi buddhimatam asmi tejas tejas vinamaham all these is said tejas tejas vinamaham balam balavatam chaham kama raga vivarjitam dharma viruddhau bhuteshu kamo asmi yaschaiva satvika bhava rajasa tamasascha so 18 different ideas which we actually saw here he already spoke in chapter 7 he is only reminding it in chapter 9 shloka 16 to 19 36 manifestations have been explained already he said aham kratuh aham you know prutah sudaham aham aushadam mantroham aham eva ajyam aham agnihi aham hrutam pitaham you know putrah pitamah all those are there so there are 36 plus 18 54 which he already said but he wants to make it more explicit in this chapter so that is how this uh, chapter is no some of them are repeated no many of them are repeated here i am only saying tejas tejas vinam you know bijam sarva bhutanam just no visa bijam sarva bhutanam he is only reminding us again and again that divinity is omnipotent or this law of conservation of divinity the law of conservation of divinity is nailing on our head again and again that is the theme of the second triplet the theme of the second triplet of bhagavad gita is you should understand this unknown quantity called divinity understand experientially not conceptually conceptual understanding is one lecture you can memorize by give a test also you'll get 100 and 100 that's okay that's not what we are talking we are talking of experientially understanding it that is the theme of second triplet of bhagavad gita if you don't understand what divinity how can you become divine and understanding divinity is not a piece of knowledge that's why chapter 7 is called jnana vijnana yoga it is not jnana it is a vishesha jnana experienced knowledge so he is repeating all that again and again in many ways 
in between he took some detours in terms of death and all that we saw Dakshinayana Uttara and all those are to support this argument and buttress it even more strongly so Om Tassaditi Srimad Bhagavad Gita Upanishadsu Brahma Vidyayam Yoga Shastri Sri Krishna Arjuna Samvade Vibhuti Yoga Nama Dashamodhyaya then we will see the next chapter which is uh, Vishwarupa Darshana. Now, this chapter, in my opinion, is the toughest chapter. Actually, others may think differently, but this is uh, my, I've been thinking about it. This chapter is tough because this chapter can be easily wrongly understood. In order to understand this chapter, appreciate, understand in the sense, Understanding is not reading and then I am not at all interested in that part of the story. In order to truly appreciate what is being told, we need what is called Sukshma Jnana, not Stula Jnana. And you can read all these shlokas, there are any number of translations, Pada Cheda, uh, you know, Sanskrit Artha for Pada and then assemble all of them. That will be actually meaningless. That will be sometime nonsensical. Sometime it will be illogical. Sometime it is foolish. I have been saying several times in this class, wherever I lecture outside also, I say that the greatest difference between ancient Indian wisdom and what we are all learning now, in the name of all degrees and programs and up to PhD, everything we do, postdoctoral, everything you do, there is a big difference. Ancient Indian wisdom is all about sukshma. There is nothing, no value in stula. What I mean by that is, you can take a shloka, you can do padacheda and understand it, you will get nothing out of it. Nothing, I am telling you. That is why reading books of ancient Indian wisdom is a futile exercise. Because this much of interpretation, if you have to write in a book, a book, Bhagavad Gita will be 20,000 pages. The economics of printing and selling will be impossible, even if somebody is ready to write. So they have to necessarily write two pages, three pages you cannot communicate. The ancient Indian wisdom is known for its tula, uh, sukshma. You have to be very, very reflective. The shining example is this chapter. Now, this chapter starts with a very dramatic two sentences. It starts in the means first eight shlokas, there are two dramatic, right? Dashtum ichami te rupam aishwaram, you know, rupam aishwaram purushottama. That's what Arjuna says. I want to see your rupam. Right? For which there is a very intelligent reply which Krishna gives in the 8th sloka. He says, Divyam dadamite chakshuhu pasyame yogam aishwaram. He never said rupam. Arjuna says, I want to see your rupa. And Krishna very intelligently replied by saying, I will give you a divya chakshus. With that you can see my yoga. These are all to be understood. He says, Divyam dadami te chakshuhu, pasyame yoga aishwaram. Whereas what he asked, Dashtum ichami te rupam, aishwaram purushottama, you know, whatever, he, that's what he says in fourth shloka. Now, this looks very dramatic. And this is an ideal chapter for a movie. Because will, Arjuna will ask, then Krishna will be there and from his eye some white smoke will start going like this. So then they will put some music and all that. Really make all of you serious. Then that white smoke will get into Arjuna's uh, eye. Then Arjuna's color of the skin will change. He will be start radiating yellow. All that people will do. Because these are all stula. Now we have to understand this Divya Chakshus. If you don't understand this chapter is a waste. This is where the whole thing lies here. Divya Chakshu is first of all nothing to do with eye. You have to first understand this. Divya Chakshu is not a you know, retrofitted eye supplied from heavens. Or you know, Buloka or Vaikunda, nothing. You know, uh, uh, Kailasha, Brahmaloka, nothing of that kind. Because it is very easy to, because the translation will be like that. I will now give you, there is no figurative giving of any kind. So the question is, what is this? If we cannot resolve this idea, this chapter can never be understood. That is why this chapter will be misled and misunderstood. So we have to first understand what is this Divya Chakshus. Right? Now, then we have to understand Pashyame, 
Yoga Maishwaram, what do you mean by C? He is saying C. Again C is nothing to do with I. Not this ordinary Vyavahara, we are, when you say C, I have to see with my eye. No, even in ordinary Vyavahara, we say I see the point, you never saw the point. There is meaning to that word, I see the point. We use the word like that. We say I see your point. Your point cannot be seen. There C has a different meaning. So that idea has to be stretched to the core in this chapter before we start. So I won't spend more time talking about this part, very little about the chapter because with this anybody can read this chapter. This front part is very important. We should understand what is happening here. Is it that Krishna gave some, did some, you know, some magic show and got him? Because this chapter will read like that. Towards the end, you know, Arjuna will say, please take me out my vision. Krishna says, I will take your vision. These are all very ideal for a movie. There is a sukshma in all these shlokas. So I want to spend first some time in positioning our understanding of what is this Virat Rupa, this, in fact, if you correctly understand this chapter, in fact, when I say this chapter, I get very, you know, when you read this chapter, you must have a hair-raising experience. Then you have understood. If it is not, if you feel very dramatized, this chapter you have not understood. It is such a chapter. If you got the right perspective, you will really know what is going on here. And it will, it will, it should send some wave in you. Every time you read chapter 10 and 11, particularly chapter 11, the acid test is, does it send a wave in you? Something must happen to you, I don't know what it is. Then you have really understood the spirit of why this chapter is positioned here. It is one of the greatest expression of Virat Rupa. So this chapter is first of all about divine vision and a higher principle of understanding the reality. Right? Now please understand reality has multiple perspectives. Let's leave all these bigger issues. You take a chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Take two shlokas or three shlokas in Bhagavad Gita. I read it, I have a different understanding. A person who is a great scholar in Bhagavad Gita, when he reads it, he has a different understanding. A person who knows nothing about Gita, Bhagavad Gita, when that person reads it, he has a different understanding. So, this is first of all a personalized experience, please understand. Not this, when you say, I see it. It's not this see it, when I say, I see your point, you have seen your point in the way you have understood it. That's a meaning, right? So, that is why reality has multiple perspectives. It is in the eye of the beholder. Vibhuti Yoga is also like that. But here it is being challenged even more because it is very dramatized. The whole idea is dramatized, so I have to say this very clearly here. Right? So people can see the same reality, people can see from oneness to multiplicity. It all depends on what is the background with which I have come. A particular event, even in a simple management parlance, when an event happens, 10 people have different views, 10 different views about it. One people, one person thinks this is a good thing that has happened, another person has thought, thinks this is a bad thing that has happened, and there are any number of perspectives in between. That is very natural. So when he says, I see and you see and all, we have to, we have to see. What they say is of no relevance to us. Seeing is a personalized experiencing idea. Even in common parlance, when you say see, when I see, it's my ex personalized experience. It's not my seeing. This is only a, you know, a gadget. What happens is inside, not out of this gadget. <coughs> it's all inside. Right? So in order to see, so in order to see the oneness, first of all, there are certain guiding principles. First of all, if you want to see oneness, which is being talked about in Vedanta and all these texts, you have to switch off all your indriyas. You don't need any of your indriyas for seeing oneness. You want the indriyas to see multiplicity. First we have to understand it. Indriyas are required only to create Veda, not Aikya. If you want to create Aikya, switch off all the indriyas. You don't need it. Because they cannot give you oneness. They can only give you Veda. There is no way they can give you oneness. So first of all, normal indriyas are not required. They are inadequate. They are incapable. So let us not approach this chapter saying, when he is seeing, he is seeing through his eye. He cannot. These ideas are not that. So something else is happening. Because it is a sukshma tattva. It is not a stula tattva. It is not about Veda. It is about Aikya. Oneness. Yeah? Human vision. See, our seeing and human vision is what is called Bahi Indriya. You can only see outside, no? 
If you sit in contemplation, close your eyes, deeply close your eyes and then manaha samadhiyatam, bring your mind which is vibrating at thousand you know, frames per second or thousand frames per minute. If you can bring it to hundred frames per minute, you slow down your mind, then you can see something more. Otherwise what you can see is only outside. So human vision is only Bahiendriya. Whereas divine vision is, you know, Atindriya. It is beyond Indriya. In fact, Indriyas are not required. Let it be there. They are required for some other purpose. See, don't use uh, some apparatus for something else. You cannot use a spade and say, let me, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, tighten a span, uh, you know, uh, a bolt which is a six-headed hexagonal bolt. You cannot use a spade. Nor you can use a nice spanner to uproot a tree and then plant it somewhere with a small spanner. Don't do that. That Bahya Indriyas, Indriyas are required for something else. Whereas now we are talking about something else, don't bring all those apparatus. With that perspective you cannot appreciate what is being told. That's why they call this Jnana Drishti. It's something else. It's not seeing in that sense of the term. Right? So as far as this chapter is going, goes, when he says, Drashtu Michami, Dadami, De Tibya Chakshuhu, that seeing has nothing to do with any of this. It has nothing to do with using the pair of eyes or manas, even not even manas. Manas is only a super indriya. Even that is not what we are talking. Something more. Not even the matter for consideration for the intellect. It's not even its intellect. There's something happening beyond all this. That is being communicated. That's the challenge of this chapter. Yes, I have already said. Why am I put it two times? Oh, it is frozen. This is frozen, looks like. This is not moving. Why is this frozen? The frame is frozen. <laughs> yeah, let me see. Uh, this is creating a problem, I think. Can I switch it off and... Huh? Huh? Yeah, yeah, I will switch it off. Maybe let me switch it off from here. I think the this thing is frozen. Uh, LCD. Let me just see. No, no, I minimized it. I was trying to find out what's happening. So technology, you know, we'll have to moderate all our... Uh, behaviors. So I was going in a particular pace and I <laughs> just anyway. It will take more time to let me switch on. No, it's, it's taking more than a minute, I think. Blinking huh? it, Yeah, it is also blinking here. I was wondering whether it is blinking eternally or... Uh, stop. Okay. Stop, yes. yes. I hope we will be able to... Huh? No, no, I'm only wondering after warming up, where is it? <laughs> I know it takes time to warm up. Yeah, if this is not, then the problem is with the laptop. We'll in that case go ahead. Let's not worry about inner vision. We are really at the point now. Sri Krishna says don't use all that. Go independent of that. Still not coming. Should come, no? Oh, it has gone back to off. I think the problem is with the projector only. Problem is with the projector. It's gone back to off again. Uh, now it is on. Yes. God has been kind to us, I guess. Yes. So let us resume. So I was... So therefore the point 
is uh, first of all we cannot use indriyas indriyas are useful only when you want to see the world of differences subject matter for chapter 11 is one not many therefore all those apparatuses are of no use actually what is seeing seeing is a developing a sense of consciousness it is a pragnana it is not uh, you know image being captured in a lens which is being mapped on a an apparatus called mind and then it uses chitta and buddhi and out of it it makes sense of that is not what it is you can switch off all these it is about a sense of consciousness which does not require any of these indriyas for identification verification validation it's beyond all that that is the matter on which they are actually trying to discuss this chapter so imagine how difficult this chapter is going to be in terms of expressing it our difficulty is to understand it i am now talking about somebody who goes through that experience how is he going to say that that is the biggest challenge right and it is not an object of universal oneness is not an object of perception the moment you start perceiving you will see only differences while you perceive the differences you should see when you see the necklace when you see the ring when you see the chain when you see the stud you should be able to also see the gold that is not obvious you have to do some more homework within you there is nothing to do with the object it is something to do inside that is the point right it's a real challenge that we will have to do because this is all about many in one there is another thing see this divinity's role in lalita sagasrama it comes so beautifully it says srishti kartri brahma roopa goptri govinda roopini samharini rudra roopa thirodana karishwari sada shiva anugrahata anugraha panchakritya parayana divine activity is five fold generally we know only three srishti sthiti laya which is you know creation maintenance and annihilation srishti sthiti and laya there are two more one is called anugraha thirodana we'll talk about it later there is something called anugraha this is a very important element of divinity which uh, why we are not thinking about it i'll give personal examples i'll give examples which we all know there is a see we keep i i keep reading a, there, there is a paper i'll take a simple example because this is the experience all of us have. we should know what is this anugraha i take a, i take a paper i keep reading it i read it today it, i didn't it didn't make much sense to me i just left it then tomorrow i read it it didn't make sense to me third day when i read it something clicked same paper only i'm reading i read today it didn't click tomorrow i read again it didn't click something happened it was not going into my head these are all the words we use the question is why did it click the third day what is the variable which was not there yesterday and day before which is there today i learnt it same thing i was doing some work at home or at my office it didn't it was not happening suddenly it clicked we use the word suddenly it clicked I mean, we have we have actually pushed all of them to the under the carpet we say suddenly it clicked i witnessed an accident in the when the accident happens when the accident happens suddenly some two three people come and then this person is saved now why would when that accident happen an ambulance must come somebody must come and help somebody must say no no let him let us take this person to why are all these happening what is the variable which will describe all these in other words in everything that we do good or bad is not the issue in fact because these are all beyond good and bad everything that happens is because of this fourth attribute called anugraha this is a work of divinity if you have ahankara to say i did it i want to wish you good luck because before you finish i did you should breathe before you collapse before that for example which is again a function of anugraha see there is one person this happened in tamil nadu this happened from time to time this happened about 40 years 50 years back this happens from time to time there is one you know yogi one siddha see there are some saiva siddhantas they do a lot of siddhis actually there is one siddha he said that i have found a medicine for immortality big announcement and all that it created because everybody wants immortality after all 
So, you know, even if there is a possibility of such a thing happening, we will still want to try. Because, you know, suppose it clicks. So, there was a lot of, uh, you know, this thing, fanfare and so on. So, it really built a lot of, you know, positive vibes. So, this person said that on a particular day, so this really gained a lot of momentum, it's about 40, 50 years back. On a particular day, he said, I am going to give this first dose to a prominent personality. All these are announced, people are looking forward. This person died before that. <laughs> he didn't have anugraha. Simple. I, whether that medicine will work and all, I do not know. This is, we have to understand this. To, with ahankara, I say, I am doing this class, I should complete this sentence here. Before that, I collapse, I can't even complete this sentence. That is called anugraha. I mean, this is, we have to really deeply reflect on it. In other words, what did Krishna give to Arjuna? He gave anugraha to, you know, understand this principle. So it is not physical, it is not uh, some, you know, surroundings were cleared up or, you know, a lens was put in front of him. Nanna, because these are all not, these are all not Bahyendriyas, these are Atindriyas. Where does it come from? Every one of us have such an experience, not for this context. There are many things in our life we don't know how to explain. Everything in our life happens because of the five Panchakritya Parayana. Five activities of divinity, Srishti, Stiti, Laya, Anugraha and Tirodhana. This is called Anugraha. So what did Arjuna get? Dadami te chakshuhu, divya chakshuhu, pashyame rupa, yoga maishwaram. Dadami means I give you Anugraha. We all need Anugraha in life. In fact, everything that happens is only because of Anugraha. We may not even see it. We may not even know how to associate to that variable. That's a different story. And in godly matters, there is nothing like good and bad. If somebody has to go today, it's Anugraha. There is a meaning to it. You may not know the meaning. It doesn't mean there is no meaning. Some person in an accident must survive. Some person in an accident must die. Gobinath Munde has to go. He cannot even be there for a second. That is Anugraha again. This is a larger principle. That is a larger meaning which none of us may know. But that doesn't mean that you know, this is a problem with science and rationality. So irrational and unscientific. What I don't know, you have to dismiss it. It's a very narrow kind of a paradigm. Whereas mysticism or mythology is actually larger. It, it looks at possibilities and creates models which are much wider in its appeal, in its canvas. So my understanding of this divine vision is that Krishna says, I will now endow, endow you with that anugraha. Moment you have the anugraha, it becomes apparent. I read the same paper three times. It became apparent only the third day. It didn't happen the first two days. I tried doing something, it didn't work. Third time it worked. Where did it happen? That element is called anugraha. That is what is given to him. Not uh, So Dibya Chakshu don't understand it in a figurative sense. Special eye with a high resolution or a you know, telescope which can go beyond universe. None of those. You have to understand that. This chapter also is communicating something very, very important. If you miss that essence, we miss the chapter. What is it is saying? It is saying a person who really evolves, a person who says that I have become, a, my Vyaktitva has become purer, you can use spirituality, divinity are all adjectives. Your Vyaktitva must become pure, crystal clear. You know what is the acid test for that? The acid test for that is the world outside will be multiplicity. You have to reconcile oneness with multiplicity. Both exist. Necklaces and studs and earrings and bracelets will coexist along with what is called gold. Our ability to see both is that person whose Vyaktitva is pure. That is why in chapter 10 he talked about multiplicity. Here he is trying to figuratively put all of them, fold them into one called Virat Rupa or Vishwarupa. So there is a message here. Message is our ability to develop the capability to reconcile. So people who are spiritual, you know, this is again a major misconception. People who are spiritual will give up everything in the world. They will not be interested in anything. These are all, you know, I have also gone through for 10, 12 years, you know, thinking that's what it is. It is not. A person who is spiritual will be here. While it comes to Vyavahara, they will be at their best. But when it comes to Ashraya, they will be at their best. 
they know how to reconcile the world of multiplicity with the world of oneness you have to develop both the perspectives you should be able to handle both the more and more we are able to have handle both of both of them the purer and purer we become we will truly become purer lots of uh, you know dirt and lots of pleasures and pains and all will stop bothering us that is what he wants to also communicate that's why he talked about multiplicity in chapter 10 he wants to talk about oneness in this chapter spiritual evolution developing this personality which can be wonderful comes only when we are able to reconcile the world of multiplicity world of multiplicity is one level of understanding that's not the only understanding world of oneness is at a much higher plane that's another level of understanding you should be able to coexist in both the levels that is a great evolution ability to coexist with both the realities that is one second thing is in the destruction is an important aspect of reality that's why in this chapter you will find lots of shlokas only on destruction very fiery shlokas it's all you know people are all consumed and then crushed and powdered that kind of description this chapter is all dramatic and figurative that's why you don't read the english meaning you will get nothing out of it it's only a fancy or fantasy and nonsense anyway because you'll ask how can people crush and eat and all we can get into all this thinking this is being told in a very dramatic way but there is a sukshma to all that destruction is an important aspect of reality don't think destruction is bad or negative death is a very important element of reality as much as birth is understand this twin realities right good and evil are part of the same of the reality it is only the measure of evolution of self in in evil the evolution of self is non existent in divine the evolution of self is almost complete that's the journey on that's a sliding scale on which we are all taken positions and we know that the direction is here from a position of being an animal and evil to a position of an evolved being where you can manage both these are are to be understood kept at the back of our mind when we read the shlokas always shlokas by themselves there is nothing to really get out of it right so it's all about that there is one last issue about this chapter which i want to talk before we get into the chapter before that this is from arbindo's essays on gita i really loved this passage that's what i thought i'll just reproduce it here look at what he says about indian religion of course his english is very tough we have to read a few times to you know he says to put away all the responsibility for all that seems to us evil there is something called evil which exists who said it doesn't exist it does exist the question is in your model how do you position it that's the question now he is addressing that question to put away all the responsibility for all that seems to us evil or terrible on the shoulders of a semi omnipotent devil you create another entity called satan or devil and say all these belong to that okay that's one possibility he is talking about what is this paradigm how do you explain reality that's what he is talking about one possibility is you say god good things now create one more entity called satan or devil all bad things are put there now you have created two now you have to now bridge these two you should say where from they came and where will they go a lot of questions will come if you do it that's what he is saying second put it or put it aside as part of nature i want to evil is part of nature divine is something he will is part of nature making an unbridgeable opposition between world nature and god now you are creating two natures now there is a world nature which will have evil there is a god nature which is all nice then where is the bridge between these two is asking he is asking make it so unbridgeable between world nature and god nature as if nature was independent of god this is a second possibility or he talks about a third possibility to throw the responsibility on man and his sins as if he had a preponderant voice in the making of this world or could create anything against the will of god so now you throw everything on me then you have to give me some possibilities of doing something na you can't throw everything on me and then uh, leave me high and dry that's the third possibility he say all these when I mean, he didn't attack directly the semitic religions but you know what he saying is all these are very clumsy 
These models are imperfect models. They are very complicated models. The moment you get into this model, you have to do a hell of a lot of explaining of what are we getting at. So he says, the, if you look at Bhagavad Gita or ancient Indian wisdom, it has actually stayed, it, it has thought all these are clumsy. That's not what it is. All belong to one. Now you have to explain the continuity. That is what he is showing in chapter 11. He is going to show a lot of evil now in chapter 11. So he, this was his argument, Aravindo's argument that if you had kept it outside of God, then you have a big problem. You don't know how to explain. Where from it came? Where will it go? Who controls it? Is it higher than this or lower than this or equal status? Or you know, how do you do the transition? It gets into lots of murkier arguments. This is his justification as why evil is very much part of divinity. That's a much logical model in which you can connect pieces very well. So that's what e. Arvindo is talking about. One last issue about this chapter. There is another big challenge in this chapter. See, forget about Divya Chakshu and Arjuna seeing it. Leave all that here. I had a very memorable experience in my life. You had a very memorable experience in life. Memorable or in an extraordinary experience. See what Arjuna is going through, an extraordinary experience. Leave that aside. We all have our own quota of, in your own ways, I have gone through an extraordinary experience. How have we reacted? How will we normally react when there is an extraordinary experience? How will we react? Think about this idea. We will do these things. 99 of us will cry. If you go through an extraordinary experience, that's why every time a Wimbledon you know, title is won, they cry. Don't think they are cowards or they are afraid. I mean, they are, it's not that. You shed tears for 100 reasons. Out of joy, you shed tears. Out of your disbelief, you shed tears. Out of your ability to express something which when you are awestruck, you shed tears. God has given these tears for many reasons. It's a wonderful communicator actually. So 99 out of 100 of us will do this. A vast majority of us will do this also. Then we will be in a deep silence. We will become very reflective. Now this awestruck experience can be good or bad. Don't worry, in both it will happen. Whether it is good or bad, when you are hit with an experience which is uh, out of the ordinary, you will do all this. You will cry, shed tears, you will become very deep thought. You become very reflective. Good or bad, happiness, that's not the issue. This will be common to all of them. That's the second thing that will happen. The third thing that will happen is honestly we will have severe deficiency in communication. Because it may be, you know, it is out of the ordinary, no? So our, uh, this connection will be lost. Chitta, buddhi, these connections are all that fat table will get corrupted. So our expression will be not good. Very natural. We will be incoherent in explaining, we will be illogical, we will be half sentence. We have our own experiences in life. Correct? So severe deficiency of communication is a reality. Leading to incoherence, illogical or even contradictory statements, all that we will do. This also we will do. One, I mean, these are all different stages. This is stage one. Then we will go here. Then we will go here. After some time we are little more settled. We will be more coherent. But we will find we are not able to explain what we want to say. Because the experience is so extraordinary. However much you use words, anecdotes and so on. You realize that it is not enough. It is beyond expression. Still you want to express. That is what you will see in this chapter. If a small experience, worldly experience, if we go through this idea, and if Arjuna can get that vision and that experience, and if Sanjaya, in fact, I, I believe the job of Sanjaya and Vyasa are very difficult, given this. How are they going to say that? Because it is all going to be all this. If, if what is being told is true, what you can get is only this. You will get illogical statements, you will get uh, things mixed up, little bit of incoherent things. If you read this chapter, you will feel like that. Suddenly there is a prayer, suddenly he says, take me out. Suddenly, you know, he says things which uh, look weird. All that you will see in this chapter. It's not surprising, because extraordinary experience. The experience is beyond Indriyas. 
you use indriyas to express it look at this thing what you got is a pragnana but you want to also communicate it when you try to communicate it you will see the futility of communication it happens to simple things in our life worldly matter when you have an awesome experience we go through it who said arjuna will not go through it he has to go through it he will have a lot of difficulty and the job of vyasa who composed this and the job of sanjaya who does the commentary of seeing it is even more complicated with all the spirit i want you to see chapter 11 if you can understand the meaning of all this if you can understand the implication of all this this chapter can make sense if you don't understand this we stay it read as we will see i don't know what to do with that it's like he says i saw this there is four heads or something thing will be there so they are all at best some way of trying to tell you something because it's so good i want to tell you so i'll end up with my own limitation of my vocabulary and with all my incoherent because i am in a very excited state that is what you will find in this chapter so when we read this chapter while we see all that we should be able to go to that we should pray for that anugraha for us we should say can i have that anugraha to understand what is being told although told differently that's a way to understand this chapter otherwise these english translations loka and are all sada sida you can read and then oh okay now this mean this that's what i'm going to do anyway with you in a limited time what else can i do of course this much uh, you know if i have to write it what i have said if i want to write for chapter commentary for this this would be about 40 50 pages right now this half an hour of what i have spoken if i put it properly that's why people don't write such commentaries in a book it gets too voluminous that's why ancient in indian wisdom must be transacted in a guru shishya kind of a thing where somebody can exchange where there is so much you, you can put only in you speak and bring that you know okay so this is the third largest chapter chapter 18 is the largest 78 shlokas chapter 2 is the second largest 72 shlokas this chapter has 55 shlokas also because arjuna is all in an excited state the meter is a different meter if you look at you know from chapter 2 of bhagavad gita bhishmam dronam katam samke uh, pujarho arisudana there is one shloka fourth shloka that meter is different it's not anushtup it's a long meter vasam si jirnani yata vihaya is a different meter if you see one trend in bhagavad gita when some very exciting ideas a very emotional idea is being communicated the meter will become longer in this chapter you will have only long meter so 55 is equal to some 60 or 62 when the meter is long because when arjuna is seeing it he is all in excitement how do you communicate it the vyasa has chosen a longer meter vyasa has chosen a longer meter in throughout bhagavad gita where the issue told is profound emotional awesome you will see it in chapter 2 you will see it here you will see it in chapter 8 you will see it in different chapters you will see when the item told is a very exciting very emotional meter will become longer so there are 55 shlokas here but meters are all not the anushtup it's a version of that variation of that which is a longer meter meter is number of words meter is a number of aksharas not word anushtup has 4 and 8 32 gayatri is a special form of anushtup 3 into 8 see it, it is better to know all this because in fact many times i find printing mistake only by meter i count how many aksharas there is look at here i showed it long back once look at here there will be exactly you know 8 8 8 four padas each 8 you just see evam e vam right e again there is a e e vam e tat dya tat ta So eight. Up to this, there is eight. Tuam is one. At at is one. It's the pronunciation. Ma nam pa ra mesh vara mesh ishwa are all one ra. They are all samyutta aksara. No, it's exactly eight here. In fact, like the I use this first to find is there a printing mistake? Sometimes there are nine. that means there is a printing mistake i go and check some other text then i know i mean unknown shlokas this is anushtup so 8 
88. I'll show you the longer meter, little down. No, no, yeah, this is very long. I have compressed it in two lines for my purpose of my PPT, I have done it. This is a longer meter actually. This is not Anushtup. You will find more, more in it. I mean, there is another version of it. So, you know, the meter is, uh, whenever there is excitement or something, it goes for a, anyway. Okay. So, there are 55 shlokas here. And the first 14 shlokas is uh, giving the divine vision. Divya Chakshus. To, so, first four shlokas, Arjuna makes a request. Second four shlokas, Krishna says, okay, I will give you. Then Shloka 9 to 14, Sanjaya says, oh, this is what is. Sanjaya is also blessed with that. He says, this is what I am seeing. Sanjaya is blessed with seeing the whole thing. Again, seeing is not seeing. Oh, he has got the anugraha to recollect all of, I mean, comprehend all that and tell. It's an anugraha. It is not any physical. So that is the first 14 shlokas. Then 15 to 31 is Arjuna's description of the Vishwarupa. He is awestruck. So he does all that. Then out of excitement, he doesn't know what to do. He actually surrenders. I mean, he is awestruck. So he sees Krishna. In fact, I want to quote next class because we are already running out of time. Next class, I'll show you. What was the frame of mind of Arjuna before this happened? There is a beautiful narration in Mahabharata. I'll show you that. And then what, you see the shloka, he says, he is completely awestruck now. Because something has happened to him. So that is what happens here. He is awestruck with this experience and so he doesn't know what to do. He starts offering prayer because he is overwhelmed by this vision and the prajnana that he got. So that is what here, 32 to 44. And then of course the last 10 shlokas are, you know, in a dramatic sense you are, he says, leave me, I don't want to see this anymore. So Krishna restores. These are all very dramatic. Don't attach too much uh, meaning to it except to say that his anugraha is, comes to an end. Then he behaves normally. So then uh, one or two very nice ideas which Krishna says. What you see people cannot see unless you have bhakti. Is what with that the chapter ends. In between there are a couple of shlokas where Sanjaya is uh, witness, no? So he is saying this is happening, this is happening. There are 40 shlokas out of 700, 40 or 42 in which Sanjaya comes. Out of the 400, 700, 42 shlokas are Sanjaya's commentary. So it has nothing to do with the teaching. <coughs> Sanjaya says this happened, this happened, like that. There are about 42 shlokas I think, uh, in the whole of Bhagavad Gita. So that is how this chapter is. Uh, I'll just take one shloka for continuity and then we'll continue in there. So the first four shlokas is Arjuna saying, please, I want to see. That's what he ended chapter 10. So Arjuna says, I want to see that Ekamsha. You said, it is one of your part in which the whole world is. Can, you, can I see it? That's the question Arjuna actually started with. And then these are the two slokas. Of course, first two slokas I skip. These are substantive. Evam etad yatatvam atmanam parameshwara Drashtum ichamite rupam aishwaram purushottamam. So he says that evam etat yata tvam atmanam. If this is what you are manif this is what you are, all that you have discovered, because the continuation of the Vibhuti Yoga and Ekam Sena Stito Jagat, that is the reference for him. He says, if that is what it is, you have said like that, I want to see you in that form. So he says, Drashtu Michami Rupam. He says, I want to see your... So that is a physical meaning to this question. But the re reply with Krishna gave, gave did not have a physical meaning. That's why I am saying, he never said, see my Rupa. He said, see my Yoga. Means, see this truth. See the truth. What do you mean, seeing the truth? Nobody sees the truth. Seeing the truth means, avagamanam. I have understood. I see the truth behind. We use the word like that, no? When you say, I see the truth behind, you don't go behind and see something called T-R-U-T-H, nothing like that. It's a concept, I have, I have understood. That's why Krishna's reply is very careful. He never said, see my Rupa, he said, see Yoga Maishwara. That's what he's going to say. So he says, Drashtum Ichamite Rupam Aishwaram Purushottama. So you can, English, you can demonstrate it, I want to see, 
see your uh, divine form and then our imagination will go somewhere. There's no divine, seeing divine form and all. It's understanding and experiencing the divinity that you spoke so much. That's the meaning of this. You can't take a figurative meaning here. Manyase edi tat shakyam. If you think, see how much he has melted now. From that position he was in Bhagavad Gita, he has completely melted. Because in chapter 3, you know what he said? In chapter 3 he said, in chapter 5 he said in the first sloka, make up your mind, you are confusing me. That was Puram Yekam Nishchistya. That's what he says in chapter 3, first sloka and second sloka. And chapter 5, first sloka, same thing he says. You are confusing me. The language has changed now. What he is saying is, Manyese Edita Shakyam Maya Drishtumiti Prabho. Oh Lord, if you think I can see, see the change in his perspective into the whole. Slowly he is getting overpowered by this divinity that makes people humble. The idea is the more and more we become divine, our egos, ego will find its place. So he says, Manyese Edi Tat Shakyam Maya Drishtum Iti Prabho. If you think I can see, right? Then he says, Yogeshwara. I see what are all the prize he is showering on him. Yogeshwara, Yoganam, Ishwara, Yogeshwara, Yogeshwara, Tato Metum, Darshayam, Atmanam, Abhyayam. If you think it is possible, in an uninterrupted Abhyaya, I want to see you. Please do something. There is a complete melting. This melting will happen to every one of us if we travel on the road of bhakti. We will never become weak. Don't think melting is weak. Melting will become stronger. When you melt, you will become much stronger. Your fear will go. Abhayam vai prapto si janakaha is what in Bhagadharani Upanishad Yajnavalkya told Janaka. Now you have become fearless. You have now understood. Your fear will go. There are needless fear you have because you are carrying everything on your head. Bhakti will actually offload all of them. You will become fearless. Not you will become meek, surrender. Surrender does not mean meek, you know, weak, hopelessness. These are all, you know, mental models about bhakti. They are all wrong. Unless you travel in your own way in the path of bhakti, you cannot even size what this bhakti is. The pro predominant thing is you will become much stronger. You will melt. That will give you more courage. Even to in your vyavahara, you will be more, more and more involved without fear or favor. I think that's what we want. That's what this uh, bhakti will give. You see it in him. He has melted. He is going to give him courage, not weakness. We will continue in the next class. Thank you.